Set up one more thing. Great. Okay. Well, good morning. I'm again Ryan Patterson, the um, Arts Capital Program Coordinator with the Maryland State Arts Council, and I am uh, pleased to welcome you all today to join session two of our Capital Project Strategy Strategies for the Arts webinar series. Uh, we are joined today by our two co-hosts, uh, Kaylin McGough and Michael Percorny of CapEx Advisory Group. Um, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, sure. Uh, so my name is Kaylin. I my background is actually in community economic development. Um, I worked for the city council in Baltimore for about seven years before leaving to work for a nonprofit that was uh, leading a capital project in a uh, kind of historic site that had long been long vacant and uh, required every funding source we could find. So um, my experience is in uh, fundraising for capital projects, and I've been with CapEx for about five years. Uh, my name is Michael Picorni. I was at the city housing department, I think when Kaylin was in the city hall, and then spent about 10 years running the Mid-Atlantic Regional Office for the Reinvestment Fund, which is a nonprofit banking institution called a CDFI here in Baltimore. Um, so very familiar with how to finance uh, nonprofit impact-driven projects and you know how to evaluate their sort of capital program needs, which is basically what we're here to talk about today. Great. Thank you both for joining. Um, I'm going to go through some of our, uh, and for doing this today, I'm going to go through some of our grounding documents to get started, and uh, um, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to you guys. Great. So um, as you all may, are probably familiar, we're, we're starting today's, we're holding today's meeting via Google Meet. Um, here's some of the instructions, a quick overview of the, the controls at the bottom in case you don't use Google Meet. Um, you can keep yourself on mute until uh, time for questions. You can turn your camera on or off as you like. And um, you can raise your hand if you have a question throughout the session or at the end. Um, there's also uh, a chat feature uh, with the little kind of word bubble icon over on the right. and. Um, um, I don't think we'll be using the other details for that, but please stay on mute as the meeting progresses and raise your hand if you have a question. I'm going to begin today with our land acknowledgement statement that um, um, I'll read aloud for accessibility purposes. And this land acknowledgement statement derives from MSAC's land acknowledgement project in which MSAC staff consulted with tribal peoples whose lands are claimed by the state of Maryland. We acknowledge the lands and waters now known as Maryland, our home of its first peoples, the Akahonic Indian tribe, the Assateague Peoples tribe, the Cedarville Band of Piscataway Indians, the Choptico Band of Indians, the Lenape tribe, the Nanticoke tribe, the Nase Waywash Band of Indians, the Piscataway Kanoi tribe, the Piscataway Indian Nation, the Pocomoke Indian Nation, the Susquehannock Indians, the Yagahaney River Band of Shawnee, and tribes in the Chesapeake watershed who have seemingly vanished since the coming of colonialism. We acknowledge that this land is now home to other tribal peoples living here in diaspora, and we acknowledge that the forced removal of many from the lands and waterways that nurtured them as a kin. We acknowledge the degradation that continues to be wrought on the land and waters in pursuit of resources. We acknowledge the right of the land and waterways to heal so that they can continue to provide food and medicine for all. We acknowledge that this is our collective obligation to pursue policies and practices that respect the land and waterways so that our reciprocal relationship with them can be fully restored. You can visit msac.org for more information, including maps, tribal histories, key concepts, and best practices for making and delivering land acknowledgements. Next, our equity and justice statement overviews our commitment to these principles. The arts celebrate our state's diversity, connect our shared humanity, and transform individuals and communities. The Maryland State Arts Council and its supporting collaborators are committed to advancing and modeling equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion in all aspects of our organizations and across communities of our state. MSAC and its grantees are committed to embracing equity and non-discrimination regardless of race, religious creed, color, age, gender expression, sexual orientation, class, language, and or ability. 
And the vision of the Maryland State Arts Council is that we play an essential role in ensuring every person has access to the transformative power of the arts. And our mission is to advance the arts in our state by providing leadership that champions creative expression, diverse programming, equitable access, lifelong learning, and the arts as a celebrated contributor to the quality of life for all the people of Maryland. In 2019, MSAC adopted a strategic plan that included the goals you see on our screen. I'll read the bolded portions now. Increase participation to provide intentional support, to build capacity, to leverage connections, and to bolster Maryland arts. And we're currently in the midst of revisiting um, our strategic plan to set new goals for the next um, period. And our creative meeting actions, we just like to begin every meeting with these. If um, folks would like to make this interactive, feel free to unmute and just read uh, one of the sentences aloud. I'll just go ahead. Celebrate being in the space with other creative people. Engage with everyone's presence as a gift. Acknowledge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Acknowledge that together we know a lot. Enter the conversation with curiosity and inquiry. Share your idea and trust that it will be heard. I statements. Focus your language on the task at hand. Hold one another accountable with care. Apply yes, and I hear your idea, and I'm going to add to it. Balance speaking and listening. All right. Thank you, everyone. Just a couple more. So as you all are probably aware, MSCC provides professional development throughout the year. You probably uh, found your way here through our professional development listings. Uh, we are always receptive to your ideas and um, suggestions for topics we can cover in professional development. Uh, or ways that we can improve it. These are some addresses you can use to submit your um, your feedback or input, and we'd love to hear from you. And there's ways to get involved. Um, we hire panelists to review our grant applications. We hire editors to help us um, uh, revise and, and improve our program offerings and our grant guidelines. Um, you can go to the Ways to Get Involved page and apply via Smart Simple, which is the same uh, portal that you use to apply for grants through Maryland State Arts Council. Uh, so we really encourage you to get involved. It's a great way to get to know the behind the scenes side of any of our grant programs or contribute your service. And it's paid. We compensate you for your time. And um, it's just a really great way to get to know the programs from a different point of view. Uh, so with that said, I will turn it over to CapEx Advisory Group and let you all take it away. We're going to have time for Q&A at the end, right? So um, you, would you prefer that people just uh, hold questions to the end or answer or at, raise your hand throughout? I, th I think we can be flexible. Um, I, you know, maybe easiest to have questions at the end, but if anyone has a burning question or is confused about something, I also, you know, want to leave open the, the possibility of answering questions as we go. So maybe just use a raise hand feature, but I'll let you guys take from here. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much, Ryan, for inviting us to be with you today. Um, we are uh, so excited about a new capital grant source uh, coming from the State Arts Council, but also in this type of uh, technical training that allows everyone on this call to be sort of better equipped to, uh, you know, to apply for funds from the State Arts Council and from, you know, every other source that you might be talking with. Um, so before we get started today, just to uh, share a little bit about um, CapEx Advisory Group. This is the organization that Michael and I are a part of. Um, we are based here in Baltimore. Uh, although we work all around the country um, with some work a lot in Florida and up in the Northeast. Um, we are an owner's representation firm primarily. So that means we work with uh, 
mission-driven organizations, nonprofits that have capital projects to help them uh, plan and execute their projects um, by providing bandwidth or expertise. Um, so something that makes us a little unique is the type of projects that we work on. Uh, we really work almost entirely with nonprofits. Um, so some examples here, are arts and entertainment, employment training, um, education and youth facilities, houses of worship, uh, housing, both affordable and market rate, um, anything that is not your standard out of the box uh, greenfield development project as the type of thing that we tend to work on. Um, and while Michael and I uh, have backgrounds that you heard a little bit about already that are more in sort of the um, community development and finance side of things, uh, our team is actually about 13 people um, whose backgrounds are in architecture and construction, business administration, um, public policy. So we try to cover sort of all of the aspects uh, that that affect community driven capital projects. So today we are here to talk about uh, the elements of a financial model. Um, I am sure that many people on this call are uh, seasoned grant writers who are accustomed to going after funds to support the operations and programs of your organizations. Um, but when it comes to a capital project, um, many people may only do this once. You know, this is kind of a once in a lifetime, um, especially if you're talking about a a major project in you know the millions of dollars, um, and the type of information that you're asked to provide um, is going to be a little different than what you would typically um, be putting together. And so we wanted to spend some time just um, introducing and talking about um, some of these pieces. And uh, I'm sure there's more than we'll be able to cover today, but it's um, you know just kind of a, a way to start the conversation. So we'll be talking about a project budget, uh, the pro forma, uh, sources and uses. And though we have it on the list, the cash flow, we may not get uh, too into that today, but that's uh, another piece of sort of the financial model and um, planning that's usually part of a capital project. Um, we'll touch on sort of a funder's perspective, and then hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions. Mm -hmm. So the project budget, um, also known as the owner's budget, uh, would include all of the costs involved. Um, these are probably some terms that you've heard before, but uh, almost every project will have hard costs and soft costs. Um, some will also have acquisition or carrying costs. If you've um, purchased a building and you may um, have purchased it and have a, a period of time during planning where you're just kind of holding on to that building, you may have um, taxes or uh, cleaning and maintenance and other other costs that are capital costs. Um, and finally, financing costs. Not every project will have it, but um, you may have a construction loan or a bridge loan or other financing that you'd want to account for. Um, but we'll get a little bit more into the hard costs and soft costs. Um, so hard costs, for me, this is the easiest to understand. This is the the sticks and bricks. This is the, you know, the project itself. Um, so this is your contractor costs for material, labor, and equipment. Um, sometimes if you're working with a general contractor, this may be um, their cost and all of their subcontractors. If you're working with individual contractors, especially if it's maybe a smaller project um, with discrete elements where you know, you're gonna have a roof contractor and <clears throat> an electrician, it, it may have sort of multiple line items that would uh, reflect each of their costs. Um, typically, you also see contingencies under hard costs, and these would be both those that are in the contractor's budget and uh, we like to see a contingency that is in addition to that, that is held by the owner. Um, and with any kind of contingency, something to think about is that it's uh, really to account for risk in a project. And when you begin a project, there is so much that you don't know. Uh, and having a contingency 
allows you to to account for that but your contingency may reduce as the project moves forward as you um you know work through design especially again when we're talking about large-scale capital projects um you know you may be able to reduce your contingency although you almost always still hold it during construction um you know you'd want to see something at the start of construction and we'll share some examples of, uh, of project budgets here. Um, but your soft costs, really, this is kind of everything everything else. Um, so your architecture and engineering, um, any kind of assessments, um, investigations of you know maybe a, a site or a structure, especially when you're building um, ground up or you're renovating an existing facility. Um, there are often specialized consultants. Um, so that could be something like a, a historic consultant or um, a kitchen equipment consultant, for example, if you're gonna have a commercial kitchen, um, there are a whole list of potential consultants that you might wanna have in your budget. Um, permit costs. Um, things like marketing, fundraising, legal costs. Um, we don't always think about those as being capital project costs, but if they are things that you are doing that you would not typically be doing um, because, you know, that you are doing specifically in support of this project, um, you know, that might be something you want to, to consider adding. Um, same thing with moving and storage or a temporary relocation. You know, this capital project um, might cause you to leave your facility for some number of months and rent somewhere else. That's a cost that is associated with the project. Um, project leadership and staff time, that can be um, something like hiring an owner's rep or even um, accounting for some portion of your staff's time on the project um you know that may be a percentage of their a significant percentage of their time um and if you you know put it into your capital project budget then you're able to fundraise to support that um as part of that overall project um and finally an owner held soft cost contingency um, again, to account for all the things that you don't know necessarily that you're going to need when you begin a project. So here's an example of a project budget. Um, you can see in this project that, that there was a, a building purchase and, um, you know, looks like it's going to be held for a while before the, the project begins or as the project is underway. Um, so there are carrying costs. Um, you have your architecture and engineering, um, maybe an environmental assessment, permitting, utility connections, um, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, branding. Sometimes that's a, a big piece of uh, a project that is not necessarily in the contractor's scope. Um, legal that could be uh, related to either contracts you know kind of helping you uh, with your contract negotiations or um, if you have any kind of land use uh, sort of zoning change that you need for your project to move forward legal can help to cover that um, and here there's a soft cost contingency which I think is like 10 percent of everything up in the list above um, there is a general contractor number in hard cost and here it's just a, a single line so this would probably mean that there is a separate detailed budget provided by the general contractor um, that you would you know be providing along with this that has all of that detail um, and then finally here there are some uh, financing related costs as well Um, so some things to think about when you're uh, trying to put together your project budget, um, you know, are there existing conditions that need to be explored? Um, so, you know, this may be a structural assessment. Maybe you're getting a new uh, HVAC system and you need to put, um, you know, some heavy piece of equipment on your roof. You might want to do an assessment of the structure to make sure that it can hold that equipment. Um, or, you know, maybe you will be 
uh, building a, a new ground up facility on a property that is next to a gas station, well, you might want to do an environmental assessment to understand, um, you know, what is in the ground before you get started. Um, the consultants that may be required, you know, this really runs the gamut and it'll be specific to your project. Um, I imagine with, uh, you know, many arts organizations, you might want to have um, an AVIT sort of consultant. Often they also, also will handle things like um, security and access control um, as those systems are, are kind of connected sometimes. Um, or if you have a historic facility or if you are getting historic tax credits, you might want to hire a historic consultant. So just kind of thinking through those areas where you need that sort of specialized support. Um, another question would be what costs uh, will the organization incur because of the project? Um, I touched on a couple of those, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, some of your staff time will be now devoted to this project, or maybe it's a relocation or moving cost. Um, financing costs, again, that could be permanent debt on a, a new building. It might also be, you know, the cost of a bridge loan, um, which we can talk a little bit more about. Um, and finally, you know, what contingencies do you want to hold? And there's no rule about contingencies um, other than you should probably have them. Um, but, you know, sort of deciding um, based, you know, with your team, what, what numbers you want to hold. So with that, I will hand it over to Michael to talk about the pro forma. Sure, thanks, Kaylin. Um, you know, it's it's one of the things about this exercise of planning and budgeting is to think about what it is you're trying to do with this. The, the budget is a tool, right? And so all tools are useful for some purpose. And these tools are often used to convey to yourself, to convince yourself of something or to convey to your board or a funder or a community, um, you know, that the project is feasible, that the project is reasonable, that the project is rational. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get farther along. But one of the things that work that Kaylin just went through does is sort of say, what are all the things I'm going to spend money on? And then the pro forma takes sort of after you've spent all the money, what do you, what is the new condition of the operation of the facility or the organization look like? What is the project allow the organization to do that is new and how does that sort of get represented in the financial ins and outs of the money in the organization or at least in the project it itself you know obviously the, the organization is doing things for a purpose of impact but ultimately people have to track the money and so that's what the pro forma is doing um, we often find that nonprofits or admission driven organizations generally uh, think of themselves as as mission driven not as also financial sort of entities with you know income and expenses and all the other things and that's uh, uh, a work that i know that brian is is working on with the state's art council and others and that we see in our clients often is like okay you do a thing that is great in the world but you also have to like pay your staff and rent your building or pay the bank for the building or you know there's other financial realities related to the impact and so what I'm saying here is the first thing we have to do in a pro forma is look at income and expenses. If you've ever sort of run your budget for your organization, you know that there's all the money that comes in, whether it's grants or other sources or revenue from services that you provide in the community. And there's all the expenses that are incurred in the provision of those services. So the staff expenses, billing expenses, et cetera. And what we often see is projects try to achieve a net benefit to the organization right that a, a project ends up making the organization stronger than it was before whether that's stronger in impact which everybody would hope would sort of be the obvious outcome but also stronger in financing that the building you know by moving into a new facility you don't have the repair costs of your old building you can allocate your staff more efficiently you can bring more kids into the daycare center or whatever it is the condition that you're trying to achieve is and that <clears throat> as a as a result of that there may be the opportunity for servicing debt with new revenue in the new facility. There may be 
uh, more or less subsidy required by the organization to maintain and operate a new facility. You know, one thing we often see is an organization that had a very sort of small and scrappy physical space now has an opportunity to you know double the size of their food pantry or whatever it is. But that incurs costs that may not be baked into sort of the thinking about the future of the organization necessarily. Like I have to heat and cool twice as much space, my utility bills will go up. Am I accounting for that in the projections of how I will be sort of financially solvent or strong in the future? Um, you know, you may have to hire more staff. Programs would hopefully expand because hopefully impact is expanding. Um, and again, like they're here maintenance and repair and new sources of income. One thing we sometimes see, you know, as organizations think of themselves more as a sort of full enterprise, that there's an opportunity for things like, oh, you know, we could hold weddings in this room that is part of our historic building if we did X, Y, Z, and maybe there's a little bit of revenue we can realize from that. Or uh, we just built a gym. And, you know, maybe in the days when the kids aren't here, we can rent it to a pickleball league and make a little bit of money. You know, there are other sources of income that might be possible for an organization to create as they think about sort of the end state of having a new physical component, a new capital project. You know, so this this is going to look familiar to anybody who's ever done an operating budget, but this is effectively what this is, right? You have time periods, years in this case, income. And in this case, we're thinking income of the building, not necessarily income of the organization, right? So are there tenants in the building? Is your own organization a tenant of the building you own or that's owned by maybe a subsidiary? Um, do you have other kinds of tenants in your building? Like in this example, the project had uh, a commercial kitchen, a restaurant, essentially a coffee shop, and the ability to rent space to what was effectively a co-working space for business incubators or small entrepreneur incubators. Um, and then there's things you would see in a normal kind of building operations. This would be very consistent with how you would model a for-profit building. You know, your, your landlord, if you have a landlord, probably has a spreadsheet that looks like this for the building you occupy now, and you're in baked into this tenant income line in his version of the spreadsheet. If you build your own building, you would have a similar spreadsheet, which is essentially what this is. So, you know, what are the expenses of the building? And you can do this lots of different ways. And the, the point is to think about what you want to use the tool for and who the audience of the tool is and what you're trying to communicate. So, you know, you, you can break out expenses by category of the building, incubator, restaurant, general maintenance, et cetera. You can break out the expenses of the building by the programs that are operating in the building, if that makes sense for your organization. You can break out the expenses of the building by any other, you know, any number of other kinds of ways. The, the communicative power of those decisions is what's sort of something you have to think about as you're using this tool to both tell yourself sort of what the future might look like and communicate your thoughts on that as a leader to other parts of your organization, whether that's staff or board or funders or whomever. Um, in this presentation, the, the project actually generated some net free cash that uh, is not hugely substantial from a sort of dollars and cents prob, you know, perspective, but might be just enough to give them comfort that no matter what, the building will operate fine and they'll have a, a little cushion and maybe they have a down year and they don't make $40,000 or whatever is a round number, but they, you know, they get close and that's all sort of what this is about, which is to explain to yourself what you think the future will look like and use that to sort of ask questions like, am I thinking about all the things that will change as I build a new building? Um, and then in particular, to the extent that you have a building that produces what's called NOI, net operating income, you might have the ability to use that income to do things like a for-profit would, which is essentially to borrow money or invest in your own enterprise again, or any number of other things that sort of you get anything you can do with, with free cash, support additional programs, et cetera. Um, Kayla, I forget, am I doing this one or are you? I can do this one. Um, so your sources and uses, um, this is basically your snapshot um, of kind of what you're doing and how it's financed. And, um, you know, like Michael said, with a, a cash flow, it doesn't necessarily look that different for a for-profit um, versus a nonprofit. Your project budget, you know, when you're building a, a new facility, 
will not necessarily look that different than if a for-profit was building a facility. Um, what will look different are your project sources. And so your sources and uses, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Your uses, you already have that part done. That's your project budget, um, basically a roll up of your project budget. Um, and then your sources are, you know, where you plan to finance. You know, if your project is able to support debt, like Michael was just showing in that last example, you know, they had some free cash flow. They actually could um, get some debt on the project. You know, that goes into, you know, what's known as your capital stack. Um, sometimes there is equity uh, with nonprofit projects. There's usually not a lot, um, but, you know, there may be some dollars that you have uh, from a reserve account or, um, you know, maybe it's uh, donations from your board that, you know, you're able to show as a source is sort of like your skin in the game. Um, and then the gap is going to be filled with subsidy. Um, and there are certain tax credits that are, you know, very useful in certain types of projects. Um, but more often than not, you know, your gap is going to be filled by grants. Um, and generally, your sources will equal your uses. So just to share an example of what this might look like, um, you know, here's the same project. Um, if you look on the right side at the uses, this is just sort of the, the roll up summary of what we saw before. Um, and on the left, we have uh, some amount of debt at the top, um, some amount of sponsor equity at the bottom. Uh, it looks like they had a property that they sold, so they were able to use the proceeds of that. Um, to fund the project. And then we have certain grant sources. Um, again, there aren't really hard and fast rules about how your sources are presented. Sometimes you'll see a sources and uses where it has specific foundation names and very specific amounts. Um, other times it's more sort of general, like, like in this example where we have public grants, you know, private grants, individual donations, um, Sometimes, depending on the funder, they'll also want you to indicate sort of what's been committed versus what is pending or what is just a possibility. Um, but, you know, this starts to allow you to demonstrate that you've thought through kind of what is feasible and that you have, you know, a plan that that generally makes sense, you know, that you're not um, asking for $20 million in, uh, you know, individual donations when your prior fundraising history suggests, you know, you can bring in about 200,000. Um, the whole sort of exercise of these financial um, documents is to sort of show the thinking that you've done um, and, and to uh, demonstrate that, you know, your assumptions are reasonable. Um, so, you know, again, this goes back to what Kaylin just said. The audience of these materials will change how you present them and also what you put into them. And in in most cases, for most of our kinds of clients and probably for most of the people on the call, the most significant audience will be the potential funder to whom you're or from whom you're seeking that's those subsidy grants that may will make up presumably the bulk of the budget or the sources uh, in the way that Kaylin just described. And so the funder's perspective, whether that's uh, the State Arts Council or you know the your legislature who's looking at a bond bill or the you know the, the NEA or the foundations, whomever that funder is, your objective is to convey, as Kaylin says, sort of reasonable information, thoughtfully constructed budgets, and to sort of induce them to believe that your project is reasonable, impactful, valuable, and sort of mission aligned to them, and that their contribution will matter. I mean, this is the thing I'm sure many of you, or maybe all of you do when you speak to donors of any kind. The nature of a capital project is that it's a much more specific, targeted ask for a particular part of a budget for a particular capital project rather than you know we need to raise x dollars a year for operational support and so we go back to our regular funders and we get that money or not this is like 
I need to build this thing. It's going to cost this much. I'm going to need the money on this day. <clears throat> and can you help me get from here to there in terms of having what I need to do that? Um, the financial model is the tool most funders are most used to seeing. But I suspect that as you move through the world and engage with the kinds of funders who are going to be interested in the kinds of projects that you all will be working on, much of what they will want is actually going to end up being the story of who you are and what you do and how you impact the world in a positive way, right? So a foundation will want to know that if they give you a million dollars, you can build a million dollar building and that million dollar building will actually cost a million dollars and you've thought about it. But really what they want to know is, does that million dollar building help the kids you think you're going to help or change the circumstance in the neighborhood where you are doing your work or whatever it is that you're doing and how is that communicated? So. You know, we are not, we don't think of ourselves anyway as grant writers, because that is your story to tell in most cases. But what we find is that the work of doing this financial presentation is often about giving you the tools you need, including some of the things that exist in a more typical commercial for-profit framework that the people who deal with large piles of money sort of tend to think in, but gives you those tools upon which to build your story about the project, what it is you're doing, why you're doing it. And oh, by the way, we know it's going to cost $6 million and here's why we think that. And we need your 2 million because we can only get four from some other place, right? Those are the kinds of statements you need to be able to make in a credible way. But really what's going to drive engagement in the funder <clears throat> is storytelling, at least to the extent that you're dealing with mission aligned funders, right? If you go to a regular for-profit bank, they will be less interested in your story and more or maybe only interested in the dollars and cents and the economics. And that may be where you have to go and that may be what you want um, for a variety of reasons that we could talk about if that was of interest. But like, you'll those partnerships might not be as valuable to you as partnerships that were with mission aligned organizations. And so one of the things that we often counsel organizations to think through is the, the um, the collection of, of monies and then their use in the world is ultimately an expression of ethics and values, right? And so you want to be working with people as much as you can, presumably with people who are values aligned with you, right? And so working with mission-based funders with whom you can have a dialogue about your mission and your impact, and that will be compelling to both you and them, is we would, we tend to think, you know, consistent with the kinds of missions and ethics that the kinds of folks that we tend to work with are about. And so, you know, anyway, that's, that's sort of a little soapbox of my own. But um, so we we have our information here up on screen. I'm pretty sure Ryan sends these slides around, but we have lots of time for questions. And, you know, having sort of primed the pump a little bit here, um, you know, we have some things we thought people might ask, but we'd, I'd just rather have you guys uh, chime in now. I haven't seen any hands yet, but uh, hopefully there are some questions cooking up. Yeah, thank you both. That was um, chock full of really good information. And um, especially from the financial perspective, it's helpful. I think so many of us are mission driven in our thinking and passionate about that. And so numbers aren't always um, our go-to method of that storytelling. So it's really helpful to hear how, the way you think about it. Um, yeah, just thank you. I, I have some questions, but I want to open it up to the floor and see what if anybody else has anything right now. Feel free to just come off mute. Yeah, Kathy, go ahead. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. I think you're still on mute. Yes, that was really, really informative. My eyes were really open to many things that I, I tend not to think about, <laughs> but uh, really, really great guidelines. Um, one thing I didn't hear, and I'm wondering if it's because it's just not in the picture. We shouldn't uh, even think that it could be in the picture, and that's corporate funding as a source. Um, you mentioned foundation grants and individual donations, and I, I know that those are much more the norm when it comes to nonprofits, but what about corporate giving? Is that too pie in the sky? Absolutely not. No, I would I would put that in the mix. It just wasn't on the example that we shared. Um, but definitely, you know, corporate grants, corporate giving, that's a 
money is money so <laughs> if you okay. know if you're able to make those connections that's great sometimes those programs tend to be a little more opaque um as far as how those funds are accessed uh you know some yeah. will have you know a website with you know this is how you apply others you just kind of have to know who to who to approach um but certainly if you can make those connections that's a great way to fund a project yeah you, you could also argue that like the distinction between a corporate philanthropic uh you know community investment division and a foundation is pretty marginal in many ways, right? Mm. The T. Rowe Price has a foundation. It's a foundation, but it's right. the T. Rowe Price Foundation, right? Um, right. Whiting Turner as a company does, like I'm just using it as an example, right? Does occasionally give money as a company, but how do you get access to that? But it is also true that Whiting Turner has a foundation that does also grant making. So like the the to Kalen's point, it's really about who you can access and how, and those corporate organizations are often less visible to the outside world as a as a grant making source but all you know the money is the money once you get into the mix your contractor doesn't really care where the money that pays the drywall sure. guy came from right um so the, it's sort of a distinction without a difference maybe so long as you can get through the veil into the into the process okay great thank you very helpful um, Michael, you just reminded me, you know, something actually we were just talking about yesterday internally was um, just how important relationships are and, um, you know, with, with any giving, right? And so I think there may be a tendency with a capital project to think, well, I don't want to go start talking to foundations until I know enough, you know, until I've really solidified the facts about my project. But especially if it's a new relationship and it's someone that you have not worked with previously, I think the sooner you can get in front of people and start introducing, you know, what you do and what you're thinking about. Um, capital projects are often long-term and, um, you know, the relationships that uh, go into, you know, getting support for capital projects have to be even longer. So, you know, the sooner the better. Thanks. That's really good. Yes, go ahead. Hi there, uh, Jess Porter. I actually am infiltrating a little bit. Um, I'm a colleague of the Arts Council and work for a local family foundation that funds a lot of arts uh, capital projects, uh, France Merrick Foundation. And this is all super helpful and I really appreciate the opportunity to share these resources and information with um, grantees that we're working with or organizations we're working with. I have kind of two questions. One is, um, how and when, um, you know, for an organization to one, engage with you all and budget for paying for this additional level of support and guidance. I'm just curious kind of how that, um, how that works um, and how they can kind of um, fundraise even for, um, you know, paying for this additional guidance. The other question is um, so sometimes, um, you know, folks come to us and you know sometimes projects are broken into phases sometimes they're not sometimes they're funding for a certain amount of phases and from the funding perspective you know a lot of times um, funders will only want to fund something if it's a certain amount of percentage of the funds have been raised but it really you know it, there's a lot of strategy i think involved in like how you present certain parts of the project mm -hmm. at different times and whether you're fundraising for the whole thing or just a chunk i just was really it's i guess a broad question like curious how you advise folks on um strategizing with breaking down por different portions of a project sure so um I, I will start by saying we we do not position ourselves with our clients as capital campaign consultants right there is a there's a universe of people that sort of directly serve organizations who are raising money in their capital campaigns who have either relationships or experience or whatever that that really deal with the the kind of the question your second question right which is more about how do i sequence my asking to be most effective and efficient now we we have obviously a point of view about that because we deal with projects that do that all the time but we tend not to like specifically offer that as a service most owners representatives probably don't because there is a sort of separate universe of people that do capital campaigns but to your first question and not unrelated frankly to your second one of the things we strongly feel is that there is a disconnect in the universe this universe in particular between the need for early money to prove out a project's viability or sort of efficacy or impact or sort of reasonability 
and and the ability of organizations like nonprofits of the kind that are on the call with us today to access money for that early stage work, right? So the the problem is, as or broadly, in a for-profit world, if you put in very early money, you get a very advantaged position relative to the the profits that might come out of an organization later, right? If you're an angel investor in Apple, you've made a ton of money. Um, there doesn't exist a similar kind of output on a nonprofit. If you're an early stage angel investor in the next great food pantry, you know, you've not made any money. You've maybe had an overly large impact in the world on a scale of impact because you gave a little bit of money and some great new thing happened from a services standpoint. But that connection is a harder one for people to sort of attach a value to in in the sort of space that we all live in, in a sort of capitalist society that we all live in, right? But, and that money is often very risky. So if you were going to a bank, they would say, no, we can't give you that money because we don't know if you're gonna sort of even be able to raise enough to pay us back ever. Um, if you're a not if you're a for-profit and you're raising money you might be like well i only need a little bit because i can make one thing and then sell it and then take you know spend the money to buy the next one and sell the next one um what we found is that foundations not unlike france merrick frankly are often the source of that very early money for nonprofits, but it's very limited and you know we we our position not just because those are the kinds of funds that we tend to pay us in an early stage engagement but just in general right we find that the disconnect between the, the organizations that should in theory be willing to take those early stage risks to help prove out, you know, the first $10,000 in a project demonstrates that it's not on an old gas station, that it, it's not gonna fall down if you put a HVAC system on the roof, that you could go get tax credits, that, you know, that your 10,000 square foot office will fit in this 15,000 square foot building. Like there is early stage work that proves a project is viable, but the money is very hard to get to. Um, and there are organizations like yours and others, um, the state, frankly, is a good source of this sometimes, that, that have like a $50,000 grant for project investigation or, a you know, we'll give you a little extra on your operating grant this year so that you have enough to do the first site investigation for your next big capital project or your only big headquarters project. Um, and the willingness of organizations who aren't looking for an economic return, who are willing to accept that risk, and who understand the incredible leverage that early stage investment investment really in nonprofits impact organizations can have is like a story we're trying to figure out how to tell and frankly the help of everybody on this call to a articulate that that's a problem and b figure out how to induce the people who have the resources to solve it to act in a way that solves it in the way that you just described jessica is i think one of our bigger guiding missions But yeah, it, it's hard. I mean, the bottom line is it's hard and we yeah. have to look for organizations that have a little bit of extra scratch to pay for some early stage work to prove that the next stage makes sense, to prove that the next stage makes sense, to get to the point where you can do the real project. And Super I think helpful. Jessica, just, just, just to add to that, you know, we tend to get involved um, I will say we we get involved at any stage of a project. Um, sometimes when you know it's just about to start construction, other times when it's very early and we are in more of sort of a feasibility investigation um, stage. And and some of what we do while we are not um, capital consultants is to think about um, you know the potential for project phasing or if there are certain types of funding that we are aware of that we think would be a good fit with a project um you know that might inform sort of how a project is broken up you know if there's a, a historic element and there are certain historic grants that are there you know that might uh dictate how a phasing you know might be thought about so that you could go after certain funds in one pot um, versus another and then again whenever you do phasing of a project it tends to make the project overall a little more expensive because it's less efficient so you know those are the types of trade-offs mm. that we would try to help uh kind of suss out that's super helpful thank you well we only have about eight minutes left anybody else have another question jason do you want to ask this or would you like me to read it oh you have to segue way to another call thanks for being here jason. go ahead carolyn 
I think uh, along the lines of the, the uh, previous questions, you talk about reasonable reasonableness in the budget. Um, how how solid do these outside grants need to be? Does that money need to be in hand? Does it need to be they've given to you historically? You've got a commitment, but the money's not in the bank. Um, what do you have any advice on that? Obviously, having sure. it in the bank is the best, but where where what's the breadth of that reasonableness? Yeah, so so there's there's two kinds of reasonableness. The first is do the uses make sense? Like, am I proposing to build a building for ten dollars a square foot? Is not a reasonable number, right? But on the other hand, am I proposing to build a building for a thousand dollars a square foot? Is probably unreasonable on the other side. And so one of the things that we work with clients to do is, you know narrow the the band of unknowns so that the endpoints are within some you know generally accepted bounds of reason like okay you think this building's going to be two to four hundred dollars a square foot or whatever and then you have a budget and then you know the sort of the bucket you're trying to fill up and then to your question um all of these perspectives in my point of view sort of revolve down to risk and who's taking what risk and when and what's appropriate to ask people to take and, and sort of do they want to come along with you on a journey that includes some risk. Um, the what I we actually just had this conversation with a client last week, the the number one constraint in terms of timing and, and to some extent risk is that the general contractor will almost never start construction unless they know you have all the dollars you need to pay them to finish and you as a general rule wouldn't want to start construction on a project you didn't know you had all the money you needed to finish because you wouldn't want to have half a building because then you've spent money for half but you can't use the building right that's like the worst possible outcome so how do you get all the money committed ready for the so the contractor's like yeah you've got all the money right is that that you convince the contractor over some course of a relationship that all the people who said they're going to give you money eventually are going to give it to you on the time they said they're going to give it to you at exactly the amounts they said they were going to give it to you in and oh by the way those dollars will line up exactly when he submits construction invoices to you for payment that's like very high risk because you don't know if everybody's going to perform and you frankly can't really predict how expensive every given month of construction is going to be although you can get kind of close so that's where somebody like a bank or a, a financial partner like a foundation even maybe steps in and says, okay, we'll give you a half million dollar construction loan or a, a line of credit. And we'll, you'll pay off that line of credit if you use it with the grants that come in over time. This is essentially what's called a capital campaign bridge loan. Sometimes it's called a construction loan. And then instead of convincing the contractor, you're convincing the bank. But the bank is charging you interest and it's their job to take that risk and it's frankly their job to be convinced by you or they're in a position, particularly if they're mission aligned, to go back to a point we made earlier, to be convinced by you because their objective is also to engage with the missions that you're accomplishing in the world, right? So like a bank that is interested in arts education is presumably more likely to agree that these grants around arts education that you're going to use to do early childhood interventions are things that they're willing to take a risk on because the outcome is so aligned with what they're trying to accomplish. And so finding someone, a bank, even frankly, a high net worth individual who's interested in, in the same things you are is more likely to result in successfully convincing them to take these risks, right? Uh, obviously, as you said, money in the bank is the best money, but you're, you're probably not gonna start with that being true because you're gonna wanna start before all the money comes in because you're trying to do the work now. I mean, the kids need the help now. Whoever it is needs the intervention today. The sooner you can do it, the more impact you can have. You don't want to wait another year to raise the last million dollars. If you've got people who said they'll give you the million, you turn around to a bank usually and say, look, I've got this letter. I've got this commitment. I've got the state budget was passed, I've, whatever it is. I know I'm good for the million. Can you give me it now so that I can get started and I'll pay you back when I get it? And that conversation which is really, to Kaylin's point from earlier, a relationship-based conversation is the one you need to have in order to sort of move faster than the money comes in. Gosh, this is 
all very good. I feel like we're just getting kind of warmed up into this deeper conversation, but I have to check us that we're close to our time limit here and want to respect everybody's time today. Um, so I'm, I think we have to end here for the day, but I so appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, uh, we, we've gone through questions. Yeah, just a one, one more minute for reflection on this. I, I, I just thank you all again. And um, for everybody tuning in, if you don't know, we have two more of these coming up every two weeks. So there's going to be another one uh, two weeks from now with Andrew Chavez. But does anybody just have any kind of like observations for the day or anything to close us out? Yes, the recording will be available. Allison, uh, yeah, last question. Um, will there be hard copy prints of the notes that are in each of the presentations? I missed the first one. I was barely, you know, back into the state. I was out of state. And will there be available materials to pick up or to print out from each of the four so we can have that hard copy from these wonderful presentations? Uh, that's a good question. We will not be printing these physically for you, but I do mail out the, I email out the recording from each session after um, the session. I sent out the first one, the, the recording from the first one earlier today, but they're available on our web, our YouTube site. And I will send you all a link to that. And at the end, I do hope that we'll make kind of a, a single resource that we'll send out to all the attendees uh, at the very end. So, thanks. That was a great question and a great note to end on. Uh, we just are trying to provide resources in between the grant cycles here. Um, we aren't going into depth about the arts capital program with this particular series, but we're trying to set you up to have the best grant applications possible. Uh, so thank you to everybody tuned in and thank you to my colleagues. Um, see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kaylin. Thanks, Michael. You guys were great. How do I get out of here? Um, close. Um.